these virtual experiences and free caption webinars. We know that uh, you know, hearing loss is isolating enough, and now we have an added layer of staying at home and more isolation. So we're really committed to bringing you more virtual meetings and webinars. So if you have a friend who has a hearing loss or thinks they might have a hearing loss, tell them about it and um, try to remember HLAA. Um, this is a very trying time and a lot of people have health issues and financial issues, but if you could remember to donate to HLAA, we, they do help support these webinars. But mostly today, I'm thrilled we have so many people. And Dr. Cliff Olson, uh, as Carla said, is founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Arizona. And Dr. Cliff is a really popular guy. We've had him on a couple times before. And he has a YouTube channel. And you know, when I think of Dr. Cliff, this is the kind of analogy is like he's the Sanjay Gupta of the hearing world or the Dr. Oz or the Dr. Fauci of the hearing world. You know, he really is a celebrity and he brings his charm, but his intelligence to the topic. And he really cares about patients and patient centered care. So we feel really lucky to have him today. And I, I hope you enjoy him. I know I'm going to. So Dr. Cliff. I'm going to turn it over to you. Barbara, you're too kind. <laughs> and, <laughs> and thank you. And thank you, Carla, as well. Um, I'm really excited to be able to present here today. I really want to give everyone an inside look at what's been happening from the provision of care side of things. And I know everyone out there has been to some degree figuring out how to receive treatment from the patient side of things. But to give you a little bit of behind the scenes of what's been happening from the clinic perspective, may be able to help you navigate for yourself how to kind of move forward from where we're at right now. Um, and, you know, I think the best way for me to go about this, and, and by no means do I expect everyone to know who the heck that I am at this point. So I want to give you guys a little bit of context of, of where I'm from and kind of how I got to this point before I get into the current state of audiology and where I think it's going. So uh, one, as a, before I jump in, just as a quick reminder, if you have questions for me, and there are going to most likely be a lot of questions, I see that there's a lot of people on this webinar right now, but please use the Q&A section. Don't raise your hand and don't use the chat feature. Please use the Q&A, uh, leave your questions there. Once I get through my portion of the presentation, I'm just gonna start diving in to your guys' questions. So make sure that you get them up there. Um, the better the question, the more chance I have of answering it. So we do have a limited amount of time today. I'm gonna to try to get to as many of your questions as possible, uh, but please go ahead and uh, when you find something that inspires you to ask a question, go ahead and put that question up. All right, so I am actually from a small farm in a town called Morris, Illinois. It is about an hour and 20 minutes southwest of Chicago, literally out in the middle of, of almost nowhere. And uh, in fact, the farm was outside about 12 miles outside a 12,000 person town. And that is where I spent my life uh, for the first several uh, or first 19 years before I ended up going, sorry, before I ended up going to the military. So I joined the United States Marine Corps when I was 19. And when I got to boot camp, they actually identified a hearing loss in my right ear. So I have a unilateral hearing loss. It is a cookie bite hearing loss in my right ear. Uh, I have attempted to treat that hearing loss with the hearing device, uh, but it actually has not worked for me. And I know at some point my hearing is going to continue to decline in my right ear. And the, uh, the intent will be to treat it whenever I do reach this point where a hearing device would help. That being said, I was fortunate enough, and this was 2002 to 2006 that I served, I was fortunate enough to become a scout sniper while I was in. This right here is a picture of the, the uh, classmates that I had going through sniper school in Camp Pendleton, California. That is me in the top right-hand corner there. I still have the same hairstyle back then as you can see that I have right now. And this was a really pivotal point for me in my life. I really didn't have much direction of where I was going until this point. And one thing that 
that being a sniper taught me was uh, about fundamentals of how you do your job and the precision in which you do it. And I'll get a little bit into that later today about how that directly relates to audiologic care, uh, at least the way that I've interpreted audiologic care to be performed uh, uh, with you know, hearing treatment. When I got out of the military, I went to undergrad university in a very small university in uh, St. Charles, Missouri, which is outside of St. Louis for exercise science. I made a quick determination that being a personal trainer was not necessarily something that I was passionate about. And so I wanted to find a career path that spoke more to me. And that experience of being in the military and having a hearing loss that they identified in the military gave me inspiration that that is something that is meaningful to me that I wanted to go into as a profession. And so I applied to every state school inside of my home state of Illinois that actually had um, audiology as a doctorate program. And for some reason, uh, they let me in because my undergrad was not in communication disorders. So I ended up going to University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, which is where I earned my doctorate. At that point, I moved out to Arizona, and pretty soon after I graduated, I opened up Applied Hearing Solutions in Anthem. And the main reason I picked Anthem, which is just north of Phoenix, is because it was underserved. They needed care there. And I felt that it was a good place for me to start up and not have any, you know, competition, so to speak. But there wasn't necessarily a huge demand. And I spent a lot of my time, and this was uh, three years ago, roughly, but I spent a lot of time in two, early 2017 developing content, developing informational video content for my YouTube channel, Dr. Cliff AUD. And so this is probably how most people know me, is this talking head on YouTube, giving as much information as I possibly can about hearing loss and treatment options, and doing it in the sense to make a better educated consumer. So if you know what to expect when going into a hearing care professional, or your better understanding of hearing devices and features of those devices when you go in to see a hearing care professional, you're going to be able to demand a higher level of care. And so that's my whole focus. My focus was not to get people to come into my doors to see me. And if you continue to watch my content, my videos on YouTube, you'll know that I'm just giving you this information. And if you want to go to someone else other than me, by all means do it. I just want to make sure that anyone who has hearing loss is demanding the level of care that they deserve to treat their hearing loss the best they possibly can. And so that created kind of, you know, uh, like Barbara said, it created a following of, of people who, who look to me for answers. And I don't take that responsibility lightly, which is why I continue to create a lot of video content, even though I am extremely busy here in the clinic, um, except for when this happened. So the COVID-19 uh, crisis is what I'll call it, but you know, a pandemic. And the pandemic really shut things down. I, I remember having a patient, and it was probably early March, and he says, are you worried about this? And I'm like, ah, you know, I, I'm really not that worried. And it was probably a week or two later that we're like, okay, well, we're not seeing any patients inside the office anymore. First and foremost, we didn't feel safe. Uh, it, we didn't feel like it was a responsible thing to do to have people come into the clinic um, you know, and risk contracting or spreading this virus. And on the other hand, there were a lot of our patients who were on the schedule who didn't want to risk contracting the virus by coming in as well. So it kind of came from both ends. People were canceling appointments and we're like, well, we're not really comfortable seeing patients inside of the clinic anyway. And so we had to make a decision. Okay, what are we going to do during this time period. And, you know, to some degree, we were able to provide a few services here or there, but I felt that it was important for if, if you as a consumer do not have access to any audiologic care and you need some kind of treatment, I felt that one of the ways that you could go about doing that with the current state of audiology is to actually maybe even just go online and find a device online. So whether that's going to Amazon, whether that's Googling and find, finding uh, hearing aid 
online that you could purchase for the time being. There are options that are out there for you. And even currently, if you don't have access to an audiologic clinic to go in and have your hearing loss treated following best practices and doing everything exactly the right way, you may just need something to get you through this immediate crisis period that we're in. And the level of crisis is different anywhere that you go. I have a lot of different hearing care providers that, that I know and, and to some degree correspond with on a regular basis. And it's been very apparent that some of the providers up in the, in the Northeast have been on restriction and lockdown a lot sooner than some of us out here on the west side of the country. And so, you know, it's really hard for these clinics to, you know, provide any kind of care if they're being limited in, in, in actually providing that care by their city or, you know, uh, their state governments. So here we are in a position where if we want to have individuals with hearing loss be treated to some degree, we have to, to some degree, have an option for them, even though we're not able to provide that care. And I think that there are several decent options that are out there that you can find either on Amazon or just on the internet alone to treat that hearing loss. Yes, you do have to be careful because there are a lot of products that you can purchase online that are from, camp, uh, from companies that are trying to scam you. And so you have to be very cautious. I would not recommend buying any hearing device until you've uh, did your thorough due diligence to identify if that company is potentially a scam or not. Um, by and large, the companies that go around and say that we sell hearing devices for one-tenth of what you can buy them in an audiology clinic, by and large, I believe that those are the companies that are trying to take advantage of you. But there's a, several other companies out there who do not market that side of it. Um, if you go on to Amazon specifically, and I have a video on this on my channel, of course, where you can get a little bit more of the details here, but you can buy pocket talkers on Amazon. You can buy Ergo hearing devices on Amazon. You can buy uh, sound amplifiers. You can buy Bose earphones. So there are a variety of different devices that while they're not necessarily hearing aids, they are devices that can provide some amplification for you to get you through this crisis period that we're in right now. Now, if you happen to be lucky enough to already be a patient of a clinic and you have devices that have the capability of being remotely programmed, there is to some degree access to provision of care via that route. And, and I was just telling Barbara before we jumped on this webinar that my clinic, and I've made the decision probably about a year and a half ago, that any new technology that comes out, we are going to jump in feet first and we're going to really become comfortable with providing different types of things that maybe uh, some clinics wouldn't be comfortable jumping into just because they're, they're really rigid with their care delivery model. And so when remote care or uh, remote programming came out to where you could have those hearing devices programmed while you're in the comfort of your own home by your hearing care provider who's in their office and have full control over your hearing aids to program, that that's something that I wanted to be able to do. And, you know, the argument against it is, is that you have limitations, well, and you do. I mean, you can't provide testing. You can't do real ear measurements at the beginning of a fitting process. You can't identify if there's earwax or something like that inside of the ear that's blocking sound. You can't determine if the device is actually malfunctioning. But you can do programming. You can do data readings from the hearing aids and, and basically triage whether or not someone has to do a drop-off at the clinic to do a hearing aid repair. Otherwise, you can make an adjustment. You can actually have a visit where your hearing care provider can see you and, and the provider, and you can see the provider. And it, it kind of opens up this world of here is an alternative way to still maintain continuity of care, even if you can't come into a clinic. And the good news is, and I'm actually giving another presentation on this later this week to hearing care professionals, where I'm gonna show them all of the different manufacturers that are out there and all of the programming that you can do remotely with their particular devices. And the good news for you is that the vast majority of these, the major manufacturers that are out there that are really putting out quality devices and technology 
have the aspect of remote care built in. It's just a question of whether or not your hearing care provider wants to employ it or not. And I think that it's worthwhile to have that discussion with your hearing care professional um, via the phone or email and see if your devices are compatible with that if you feel like you need a follow-up visit. And that way, they can use that time to touch base with you and identify if there's something going wrong with the hearing aids that you need to come in and either do a drop-off, uh, which has been happening a lot out there where you drop your devices off at the front door, someone comes out, takes those devices, takes them back, does some maintenance on them, might do a check on those devices and make sure that they're mechanically functioning properly and getting them back to you. So while the provision of care has definitely slowed down with all of this, there are some alternative ways of actually providing you with enough care to get you through to the point where you can actually come in and have that physical appointment with your, with your hearing care professional. That being said, at least in my clinic, we are very close to opening up our doors to having patients coming back in. We have provisioned enough personal protective equipment, um, face masks, gloves, Face mask brings another level of complexity, as you will know, if you have hearing loss, if you can't see the visual cues of the person talking to you, that can make things more difficult. I know a lot of hearing care providers are trying to get the, uh, the masks that have the clear windows that are in front of the mouth, so you can still get visual cues. And it, things are going to be okay. We're going to have patients come in the clinic. We are going to sanitize everything like crazy. Uh, I'm a little on the lucky side. My wife is a registered nurse who works here in the clinic. So a lot of the infection control procedures are in her hands. Um, so we'll be okay. I know that a lot of clinics are going to open that up and they're probably looking at early to mid May where most clinics are going to have at least some kind of limited services that they can provide you in clinic. So that's what's happening from that standpoint. But then the question really becomes, if this prolongs, if we have another crisis where you cannot go in to see your hearing care professional, if this current crisis in your part of the country or world prevents you from going in to see your hearing care professional, the question will become is, how do we look at what's going on right now from a long-term perspective? And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I've spent a lot of time talking with different companies and the technologies that they have to be able to kind of service our patients who can't come into the clinic. Because I think that there's, to some degree, a need to have not just remote hearing aid adjustments and programming. I think that there is the need to do remote diagnostics potentially. So doing a hearing test in the comfort of your own home and having devices programmed for you and sent to your own home. And, you know, this makes a lot of sense even outside of a pandemic period. If you are someone who lives in a remote location of the world or the United States, we need to be able to get you high level care or at least higher level care than what you can get without professional care. And so, you know, a couple different companies come to mind. So HearX is a company that uh, started several years ago and they have calibrated headphones that they can send to your home with a smartphone app that you can actually take a hearing test. You have another company which has recently come on the scene called Clementine and they have a, a unit that they're sending me right now that's called the Clementine Home Kit that has visual otoscopy so we can actually look inside of your ears and have you perform a air conduction hearing test. And then you have Shoebox Audiometry which has been around for, for several more years than these other two companies as far as I'm aware. And they have the ability to do very similar things from a self-test uh, air conduction testing perspective. Now the problem with these testing modules or these kits that they have is that you can't be comprehensive at this point right now. And what I mean by comprehensive is, is that we need to be able to perform visual otoscopy inside of your ear canals to make sure that there's nothing blocking that transmission of sound like earwax or a foreign body. The next thing is you need to be able to do air conduction. Each one of these systems allows you to do calibrated air conduction testing, which is when sound has to pass all the way from the outer ear through the middle ear to your inner ear, like sound would normally travel. But we also need to be able to do bone conduction testing to determine what type of hearing loss that you have. Is it a mixed hearing loss? Is it a sensory neural hearing loss? Is it a conductive hearing loss? Without knowing that, it's very difficult for us to recommend hearing devices or hearing treatment at all to that particular individual. 
And then you also have what I think is the main sticking point, which is the word recognition score. I think the word recognition score is the absolute most important diagnostic test that is done because if you score well on that test and you have a high percentage of words correct that you can repeat back, then it tells us that you should expect to do well with hearing treatment. If your percentage of words correct is low, that tells us that you are not going to do well with hearing treatment and may actually require us to refer you for a cochlear implant evaluation, which opens up a whole nother level of complexity when it comes to receiving treatment, because that is, there is no way you're going to get a cochlear implant uh, remotely. I mean, you have to go in for surgery for a device like that. But I think that the thing that we're a little lucky with is that this pandemic happening, as bad as it has been, I think is going to spark innovation in this area of remote diagnostics to where individuals who have issues or uh, inability to receive high level in clinic care are going to be able to start receiving a higher level of at home care from a hearing treatment perspective. The biggest barrier though is not the technology. I, I am a firm believer that the biggest barrier to all of this are the rules and regulations, uh, either nationwide, but more likely statewide. In the state of Arizona, and I can speak directly to Arizona because this is where I practice, if we do not do air conduction, bone conduction, speech testing, MCLs and UCLs, which are most comfortable levels and uncomfortable levels of hearing, then we can't dispense hearing aids. It is actually illegal to dispense hearing aids to an individual in the state of Arizona unless we have a comprehensive audiogram done. And this is different each state that you go to. Some states, they're, they're even more strict when it comes to what, what can be done. And it definitely limits access to care from that perspective. Now, I understand where the states are coming from. They want to protect their residents against these unscrupulous companies who would just not do any kind of testing and dispense hearing devices, make money at the expense of consumers. And that stuff is happening right now with a lot of online companies, but states can't fight the online companies. So essentially what the regulations uh, are restricting or just the provision of care by hearing care professionals inside of each state. So I think if for us to really move forward and have a remote access to care, a higher level care available, that some states are gonna to have to really revisit this aspect of, of what's allowed. And it, and it has to be done very carefully because like I said, if they make the rules and regulations too lax, there are going to be a lot of, of consumers who are negatively impacted by that, by uh, the bad actors inside of the industry or even outside of the industry. And then if you, if you make it too strict, again, you're going to kind of be in the same position we're at right now where clinics are going to be like, it's too strict. We can't even provide care that way and still stay in business. So we're going to have to require patients to come into our doors. So that's kind of where we're at with the rules and regulations phase. And so then the question becomes, where do we go here in the future? And I think that uh, what we're going to see coming out of this pandemic specifically is going to be pretty interesting. First and foremost, I foresee that there are going to be some companies that go out of business. I think there's going to be private practices that go out of business. I think there's potentially going to be some online companies that may go out of business from this, although I think it'll probably be more along the lines of whoever has a brick and mortar location. If they can't afford to pay their rent and they can't afford to pay their employees or pay for, you know, uh, you know, cost of goods, if they can't pay to keep their lights on, though they have no choice. Uh, they have to close their doors. Um, I was fortunate enough, and I'll share this here, that we applied for the Paycheck Protection Program loan, and we found out to, uh, a week and a half to two weeks after we were um, approved, uh, well, we, we found out that two weeks after they said that the funding was gone, we got funded. So I still think that there's some level of hope for other uh, small businesses out there like mine to actually get funded from this. But if it wasn't for that paycheck protection program loan, my staff still wouldn't be here. It would be me and my wife trying to figure out how to still provide care for our patients. And, uh, and, and it would have been significantly more difficult. Well, that's exactly the position that your hearing care providers, if you have a local provider, that's the position that they're in right now. If they did not get the Paycheck Protection Program, they are literally fighting to keep their doors open. And I get a little emotional about this because, you know, 
I know that there's a lot of discussion out there in, in the world of consumers talking about the, the value that a hearing care provider brings to the equation. And I think that there's enough individuals out there who do value the care, the high level care that their hearing care providers provide them. And right now is the time to, to show those hearing care providers your support. If they've supported you and they've got you hearing uh, better than you ever expected that you would be able to hear, even sending them an email telling them how much you appreciate them goes a long way. And uh, um, I think though that there's gonna be some of your providers who are not gonna be in business, you know, two, three, four months from now. So keep that in mind when you choose where to spend your money for your hearing treatment, okay? Um, that being said, I think, I think that online is going to have a pretty big play in this as we go forward. And I'm not talking access to hearing aids online. Everyone has access to hearing aids online right now. We don't need the over-the-counter hearing aid act to allow you to buy hearing devices online. You can already do it. What that act is going to do is it's going to try to weed out, hopefully, some of the, these online companies who are just trying to take advantage of consumers. But I think that, that if clinics and online, I think that there's going to have to be a better delivery model, and maybe not necessarily better, because I don't think it'll be better. I think it'll be an alternative delivery model that you will sacrifice some performance with your hearing treatment, but at the end of the day, it'll give you at least access to hearing treatment. And so I think that that'll be important going forward here as well. I think a lot of clinics are going to kind of follow suit and start doing more remote programming capability uh, to give that kind of access back. I think that the excellent clinics, the excellent companies out there that are providing either the technologies or the provision of care are the ones who are going to kind of come out of this on the other end and, and be successful, but be successful at treating their patients better than what everyone else is doing. I think that the clinicians who have not provided exceptional value to their patients are going to be the ones who are most suspect because when it comes down to, are your patients gonna support you? If you haven't taken care of them, they're not gonna take care of you. So maybe thinning things out a little bit will end up being better for the consumer at the end of the day. But I think that the providers who provide and strive to provide an excellent level of patient care, meaning they're following best practices, they're performing procedures like realer measurement, uh, verification and validation outcome measures, um, and, and all of the different procedures that are required to maximize your performance with hearing treatment, I think those are the clinics that are going to come out better on the other end of this. And then finally, you know, I think it's going to lead to more innovation. I think that, you know, as we go forward here, I think that companies that are are clever and creative with how they're able to provide care to consumers, to individuals with hearing loss, are going to be the ones that change the way that care is done. I mean, I, I think that it's time to have maybe even potentially hybrid models where there are certain individuals who can't come in and see Dr. Cliff Olson in Anthem, Arizona, but they want to receive as, as high level of treatment as possible, even if they can't come in. I think that that type of care is going to happen as we work into the future. And I think that the clinics and the clinicians and the companies who figure that out are gonna be the ones uh, who make things better for consumers. Because if we're looking at through the right lens, as a hearing care professional myself, the lens that we have to look at this through is what is in the best interest of an individual with hearing loss. Not what's in the best interest for me as a clinic owner, but what's in the best interest of you, someone with hearing loss. And if we approach it from that perspective, the same way that I approach it from my YouTube channel, where I create hundreds of videos that are fun and informational, if we approach it from that perspective, I think that uh, from a business standpoint, it makes sense for a hearing care professional. And I think that at the end of the day, the consumer wins. And if the consumer wins, then everybody's happy. So that concludes what I think, where we're at right now, what's going on right now, and where we're headed in the hearing care industry. Um, things are gonna change coming out of this. I think a lot of things will revert back to the way that it was, but I think that there's gonna be some major changes coming out of it. That being said, I can see that there are plenty of questions inside of the question box. And just as a reminder, if you left your question inside of the chat window, I will not be reading them out of the chat window. So you need to make sure that you go and enter them into the Q&A box, okay? Um, all right. So uh, the first, I'll just jump right in to the Q&A here. The, 
the first question that's actually in here is what is a cookie bite hearing loss? So I have a hearing loss in my right ear. I mentioned that it's a cookie bite hearing loss. A cookie bite hearing loss is basically when you have only hearing loss in the mid frequencies. So you have good hearing in the lows, bad hearing in the middle, and, and good hearing in the high frequencies again. Just as a little bit of reference point here, it, most hearing losses are high frequency in nature. All right, so you typically have good in the lows, it's getting a little bit bad in the mids, and then it gets really bad in the high frequencies. Um, very difficult to treat a cookie bite hearing loss. So if you have one, you have to make sure that you go to a hearing care provider who really knows what they're doing because they're very difficult to treat. Um, okay, so for those of us who wear hearing aids, oh, let me say that I answer that. All right, there we go. Um, so let's see, Susan Pfeiffer, so for those of us who wear hearing aids, what is the latest technology and what companies do you recommend? Uh, good question. Here's the thing. Any one of the major manufacturers that are out there, you know, you're looking at the Phonax, the, the Resounds, the Starkeys, the Oticons, uh, the Signias, um, you know, they all have really good hearing technology. And I recommend a lot of them often inside of my clinic. It just depends on what your specific wants and needs are. And to identify the right device for you as an individual, it, it takes me an hour at a minimum to identify all of the different variables that I need to, to determine which is the right product for you. So as long as you have a hearing care professional who's working with a, at least a couple of the major brands, usually they can identify a brand that will work for you. Um, okay, so here's the next question. So from Catherine, I know a recent YouTube video you addressed hearing aid insurance companies. I just today lost one of my Phonak Audeo hearing aids, bilateral severe to moderate hearing loss, and my Compilot quit working as well. Is there a way for me to have an insurance company cover some of the cost of new hearing aids? Um, just as a caveat here, I am not an insurance broker, nor do I have a full deep understanding of the insurance world. What I can tell you is, is that if you're uh, Phonak Audeo hearing aids, anytime you purchase a hearing aid from a clinic, they will come with a warranty. Now, if you bought the hearing aids online, that warranty is likely void by the manufacturer. But if you bought them from a uh, clinic, then they should have either usually a one, two, or three year warranty, depending on the technology level of that device. You can also, I believe, get riders added to your like homeowner's policy and have them insured through that route. What I can say from a Compilot perspective is usually Compilots come with a one-year warranty and they won't fix them, they will just replace them. It looks like yours broke, but that would require either a new purchase or if it's younger than, or if it's not a year old yet, they should replace it for you. So I hope I answered that question well, that's a, a tough one. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see. I'm an audiologist and not currently a member of AAA or ASHA. Traffic on several cochlear implants and hearing loss message communities indicates that most folks are not being offered teleaudiology in most localities. What are the audiology associations doing to move the profession beyond the Monday through Friday, nine to five brick and mortar model that it appears most providers are still willing to provide? Um, there have been statements by by uh, ADA, uh, uh, Academy of Doctors of Audiology, and the American Academy of Audi Audiology. I am not familiar with ASH's stance on it, but I know that there is um, you know, some level of advice coming out of those organizations. I don't think I, I'll choose to get into the nitty gritty of that right now, but um, I think that, that the organizations are encouraging some level or provision of care from a teleaudiology perspective. Um, and are helping clinics who want to be able to provide that type of care. And so I urge you to reach out to uh, AAA or ADA for more information on that. All right, so if not covered in the presentation, what is the status and outlook of audiologists being able to provide remote programming for updating uh, cochlear implant programs? And what's your understanding and outlook for OTC, over-the-counter hearing aids? Our local audiologists really disliked and have pushed back on presentation we tried for our local HLAA chapter, where we tried to bring in a Costco representative to discuss OTC aids. The Costco rep ended up declining, and we had to change the purpose of our meeting. Um, 
I'm going to pick this one apart a little bit because I don't want to spend too much time on any one person's questions, but um, I have no idea what's going to happen from a remote programming capability for cochlear implants. I have to imagine that cochlear implant manufacturers are taking a look at this to some degree given the current climate that we're in, but since I don't deal with uh, cochlear implants anymore directly inside of my clinic, I can't speak directly to that. In terms of my outlook for over-the-counter hearing aids, I did cover it a little bit in my presentation. I per, uh, Honestly, I'm a fan of over-the-counter hearing aids because I believe that that is going to bring more access to care to individuals. And I know that the natural progression, just based off of what we saw with optometry, is when you make you know like little readers over-the-counter available, individuals can get a taste of what seeing better is like. And then when the time is ready for them, they're ready to move on to more traditional treatments and a higher level of treatment. So I think that OTC is gonna help with that and get more people into hearing treatment uh, to better their own lives. But I also see it, if the FDA does a bad job of regulating this, it is going to be a disaster for individuals with hearing loss because there's gonna be people out there who think that they're buying what's right for them and really they're just being fleeced and then they think that hearing treatment doesn't work for them, which is definitely not the case in most cases. So uh, I, I'm happy to give a talk on OTC. Anytime you wanna have me give a talk, you just uh, reach out to me, Dr. Cliff at drcliffaud.com and I'll set up a webinar with your HLAA chapter. All right. So let's see here, Brad, uh, Brad, let's see what you've got to say. I appreciate your desire to educate, but the traffic suggests that the average provider is not providing the level of care that you describe uh, and, and a parentheses there, a standard of care. Um, you know, research has identified that there's a lot of hearing care professionals out there who do not follow best practices and do not hold an extremely high standard of care. It's unfortunate. But what I would say to that specifically is that there are a lot of hearing care providers out there who are absolutely phenomenal. You just have to find who they are, and that's where the difficulty is. If we continue to accept and go to hearing care providers that do not follow best practices, and for you to know if they do or not, you have to educate yourself. And that's the whole point of why I have my channel, so you can educate yourself. Spend hours watching the content and finding out what things you should be demanding from your hearing care provider. And every single state that's out there has a number of hearing care providers who are upholding themselves to an extremely high standard for the benefits of their patients. You just got to find them. All right. So how can we get Medicare to offer more financial aid for hearing aids? Good question. Um, anything that's run by the federal government, I, you know, I know I just got a loan, you know, through this whole uh, paycheck protection program. Um, but what I would say to that is I have no idea. I mean, I know that, that there are professional organizations in audiology that are in support of, you know, providing more help to individuals who are of Medicare age. And I just don't know what the right route to go is for that. Anytime you make something political, it definitely gets a little more tricky. So I'm apologize. I can't provide any insight for that. Should people be, how are we doing on time? We're doing good. I'm powering right through these guys. I am a fast talker though. So um, hopefully the captioning is going well. I haven't been watching it, um, but you can go back. This, this webinar will be posted afterwards if I spoke too fast for you and you can watch it again. I'll try to keep that in mind as I keep talking here. Should people be more concerned about buying new or used hearing aids online via eBay or Amazon? Might the devices be infected? You know, from a perspective of the COVID aspect or the coronavirus aspect, I wouldn't necessarily be worried that the devices would be infected. I would be more worried that uh, A, those devices not coming with the warranty that they post that they come with, uh, because as soon as the manufacturer identifies that that serial number was sold through an online route, they're gonna void the warranty uh, in most cases. Um, but, uh, you know, Honestly, the risk of just being taken advantage of ordering a device that you think you know what you're getting and you get something completely different and you're not even aware that the device that you're getting is right or wrong for you. Um, I think you're at more risk for that than, than contracting an infection with COVID buying online. Uh, what is an Ergo hearing device? An Ergo hearing device is a rechargeable invisible in the canal device that you can uh, purchase online. Um, does not require an audiogram, anything like that. But in this time right now, it might be a viable option for someone with a mild to moderate 
high frequency sensory neural hearing loss uh, to get them through this time period or even a little bit longer perhaps. Uh, when are you having the webinar for hearing care professionals regarding remote programming? Um, I believe it's this Friday, uh, the state of California, I'm giving a presentation to. Do self-adjusting phone apps adjust hearing aids exactly the way an audiologist does? The answer to that is no. You typically do not get the same bands of adjustments. Uh, to give you an idea, um, one of the manufacturers I, I like to work with right now, their premium level device gives me 20 adjustment handles for that. So I can adjust the frequencies in 20 different bands, but the app that they can use only adjust three different bands. So it definitely takes you down to not being able to fine tune things is finely. And on the other side of that, when you can only adjust to your self perception of sound, um, it can be really difficult because you're used to hearing things at the level of your hearing loss. So if I'm programming devices for a patient based off of real air verification, I can see that they need more high frequency. They might not like it right off the bat, but that's what they need to actually hear better. So that's what you need to take into consideration with these, you know, quote unquote, self-adjusting phone apps. That being said, I'm also testing some online devices. So devices that are available online or in like local pharmacies. And they all have self-hearing tests. What I'm finding with those hearing tests is that, yes, they might be able to identify like my cookie bite hearing loss, but when they go and they adjust the programming for it, the programming, when I do real ear measurement on those, it doesn't translate. So you can test it and adjust it all you want, but if it doesn't actually result in the hearing device doing what you want it to do, then it's not going to be of much benefit. All right, so Hillary Lewis is an audiologist. How and when can I see your presentation on remote care? As you mentioned a moment ago, um, I don't know if HLAA is okay with me mentioning this stuff, but um, if you go into the, the public, or sorry, the, the forums for audiologists uh, on Facebook, you can probably find that out as well, or you can email me after this and I can send you a link to that. Uh, does remote programming also apply to cochlear implants? And is everything on YouTube captioned? That's my favorite question ever, by the way. Um, I already answered the question on, on cochlear implants. I, I don't believe that it exists now, but I imagine they have to be identifying some way to make that happen. And is everything on YouTube captioned? And the answer to that is yes. I spend a ton of money every year custom closed captioning my YouTube videos. Every single one of them is captioned. If you can't see the captions on my YouTube channel, then you do not have captions toggled on. All right, Peggy, let's see. What can you tell us about the free annual hearing exam by phone offered to AARP members? Is it helpful? Uh, uh, what would the next steps be? Yes, so the, I believe it's called the National Hearing Test. You can take over the phone and they basically play you digits among a background noise and seeing how, how accurately you can repeat those digits back or, or dial those digits back in. And it can basically tell you with a high level of accuracy, I believe, if you have a severe hearing loss, if you have a moderate hearing loss, if you have a mild hearing loss, and then basically say, you need to go see a hearing care professional to get that addressed. So um, if you can get it free through AARP, which I know that you can, uh, go ahead and take it. it is, it's, it's helpful to a degree, but if you already know what your hearing loss is, it probably wouldn't provide much value to you. All right, so let's see here. Are the remote testing products being used with children due to the obvious complications with younger populations? I would highly not recommend that anyone under the age of 18 uh, do any kind of remote uh, hearing testing or diagnostics. It should be illegal in most states. Um, and if you uh, have someone offer you that, I would make sure that you check with your state to see if that's even legal because I don't believe that any state would allow that. It is not in the best interest of a child. All right. I paid $6,000 for my aids from a hearing aid dispenser and they are closed due to COVID. Will I have to pay a fee for service elsewhere? Um, if they go out of business and you are not able to return those devices for credits, if that's what you choose to do, then yes, if you go to any clinic other than the clinic that you purchased the hearing aids from, then you will have to pay for services. Uh, we need to start getting into this mindset of when you purchase hearing aids, not only are you purchasing the devices in most cases, you're purchasing the fitting sequence and you're also purchasing the aftercare for those devices. 
So if you spend $6,000 on a set of devices, I have to imagine that that's also covering the fitting and follow-up, then you are out of luck if that place goes out of business. So keep that in mind. I know that there are clinics that are starting to separate out the costs of those things to be a little bit more transparent for you. That is something that we do in my clinic. Um, I, uh, my answer here probably doesn't help you out a whole lot uh, in the current pandemic situation, but hopefully uh, as time goes on, uh, that, will, that will serve some value to you. All right, Jim, what do you got here? Is the VA required to follow state rules for, the, for each state uh, particular clinic is lo each state that each particular clinic is located in, or do they simply follow their own rules? This pertains to dispensing devices and qualifications of personnel working there. Um, yes, I mean, I believe even the VA has to adhere to state rules and regulations when it comes to uh, dispensing hearing devices. That being said, I mean, the way that their model is set up, I don't foresee that it would uh, run into too many issues. Um, I know that the VA has been very uh, early adopter of providing teleaudiology care. So I think that that to some degree is something that they've identified as already legal in definitely in certain states, but um, not working at the VA myself, I don't, I can't answer that completely. All right, Carol, thank you, Dr. Cliff, for providing information that is so important to our patients. We are here in New York and are setting up an amazing online program for our patients and new patients, providing the same wonderful care we have provided for 30 years. And that's fantastic, Carol. I think, uh, um, I think that your patients are going to be better served by you adapting to the changing climate of what's happening out there right now. And I think that there's a lot of hearing care providers just like you out there doing the same thing. Um, this next one's a really good question. Uh, can you provide programming for OTC hearing aids? Uh, one thing I want to make clear right off the bat is that OTC, it technically does not exist yet. So you have hearing aids that you can buy online. You have hearing aids that you can buy in the store uh, that you do not have to get from a hearing care professional right now. That being said, I don't know what the hearing, the OTC devices, what the regulations for those look like. I don't know if it's going to be completely self-programmable by the patient. I don't know if you're going to be able to bring those in and have a hearing care provider get access to some kind of software to adjust those. At the bare minimum, I would think that you'd be able to take those devices to a hearing care professional, pay that hearing care professional to make the adjustments on your tablet or smartphone for those devices and make them work better for you. But at the end of the day, until we see what the regulations are for OTC, it's really hard to speak specifically to it. All right. My audiologist's interest in my hearing health has diminished since my hearing aids were prescribed and paid for. I'd like to find a new audiologist, but I'm unsure how to proceed as it may, uh, as it may be several years before I purchase a new set. Can you make a suggestion on how I might approach a new audiologist if I already have a good hearing device? You just have to be open and honest. Um, I, I am very open and, and all of my staff here in my clinic anyway knows that when someone calls and they have existing hearing devices, they need to identify what those devices are. So if I have the capability of making adjustments to them, that is what my first course of action is. If that patient specifically states that they would prefer new devices or I feel that their current devices do not have any capability of treating their current hearing loss, I'll recommend new devices in that sense, but there are hearing care professionals out there who would happily provide you with care as long as you compensate for them for their time. Because when you're, when you're buying devices from a hearing care professional, again, a lot of that cost is going to the provision of care. And that's where the danger comes in is because once they've got your money to some degree, they, there's not a whole lot of incentive there anymore to provide you with a really impeccable level of care in some cases. All right. But if you're willing to pay for the care at another audiologist clinic, then there's a good chance that they'll be happy to take care of you. And whenever that day comes that you're ready to pursue new treatment, they'll, um, of course, oblige and help you out with that as well. All right, I have severe to profound loss and a cochlear implant and a companion hearing aid. I had an evaluation slash mapping. A mapping is what they're doing when they're programming a cochlear implant session in this last fall. Do you advise me to reach out to my audiologist to ask about the availability of telecare testing and adjustment if needed? Um, I think it's worth it to reach out and ask your hearing care professional, but at the same time, 
you know what brand you're wearing. You're either wearing Cochlear, Med-L, or Advanced Bionics. You have a consumer line. What I would do is reach directly out to that manufacturer and find out if they actually have a way to do remote uh, mapping to some degree like that. Uh, and if they do, then you know that you can actually call your hearing care provider and discuss potentially receiving that service from them. But if everybody with a cochlear implant called up their local clinician right now, that local clinician would probably be overwhelmed with phone calls. So, all right, let's see. Hi, Dr. Cliff. I enjoy your YouTube videos. I am wondering what PPE sh should a currently open practice have? If I go to a hearing clinic for a hearing test, what PPE should the hearing health professional uh, be wearing? How should I protect myself? Aprons, gloves, masks. Thank you. Um, at a bare minimum, they should be wearing a, a mouth and nose covering. So wearing a, a, a mask, a pre a preferably a medical grade mask, um, face shield to some degree. Um, although I don't necessarily think that that would be mandatory. Um, a gown would be nice and then definitely gloves. All right. So, um, it, you know, from a, from a minimalistic standpoint, a mask and gloves is definitely what your hearing care professional should be wearing. And you should be also wearing a mask as well when you go in and possibly even gloves yourself. Um, the things that you do outside of that as well matter. So having hand sanitizer, making sure that your clinician has sanitized everything for you. Any clinic that's going to be open is probably going to have pretty strict um, um, infectious control procedures at the moment. So just keep that in mind. Um, what is my opinion of the lip reading mask? So I actually ordered the lip reading masks. I forget exactly what they're called, but they have that little window cut out uh, that has like a piece of plastic in front of it. So you can actually see the mouth of the person talking to you to help you with visual cues. Um, I think it's a fantastic idea, to be honest with you. Fantastic idea. Um, the, the problem is, is that no one can get them right now. They have been sold out. They've been on back order. I'm waiting for my clinic to get them. Right now we have some N95 masks that we're using. Um, but for individuals with hearing loss, as you know, visual cues add up to a lot of speech understanding. So hopefully those come back in stock fairly quickly. I know that my clinic will uh, from this point forward, have a stock of them in clinic just in case anything happens again. Sometimes it takes a crisis, right? If you're opening soon, how do you plan to maintain some sort of social distancing when doing evaluations? You have to get close in proximity to use an otoscope and such. Um, very valid point. Um, to some degree, social distancing is is not going to be happening entirely, but what we're choosing to do is restricting the type of patient that can come into the clinic. We have intense screening protocols. Uh, when people call to schedule appointments, temperatures are being taken when they come in. Uh, we will have PPE on, and you know there is some level of risk. I mean, there is some level of risk in anything that you do. The question is, are we mitigating that risk enough and yes, doing otoscope, putting headphones on a patient, putting earphone inserts inside of a patient's ears are all things that would require me to be within six feet, even though I have exceptionally long arms. Um, it, we just have to be careful and use the proper PPE to do so. I have people tell me they have hearing aids and that they don't help much or aren't enough. What should they be doing next? A second opinion. If so, how... Uh, uh, if so, how know who good? How, how do I know who's good? Um, the vast majority of time, so here's the thing. The outcome with hearing aids is largely known. So when someone comes into me and we take them through a hearing evaluation and I prescribe hearing aids that are right for them and I take them through best practices of fitting those hearing devices and explain everything I'm doing as I'm doing it, by the time we're done of the fitting period, that person knows exactly how much benefit they're going to be receiving with hearing aids because we've measured and verified everything. There is nowhere else to go unless you're willing to use an assistive listening device like a remote microphone or a table microphone. And if your hearing care professional has not instilled that level of knowledge and confidence in you, I would question whether or not maybe that's the right hearing care professional for you. Um, you can go and receive a second opinion, but at the end of the day, you should be able to look at the way that a hearing aids program based on objective measurements done inside of your ears and, and have an understanding of, of how well those devices should be working for you. Dr. Cliff, I just need to remind you, just maybe time for one more question. Very good. I will try to make it a really 
good one here since I, I'm a long-winded guy, but let's see. Okay, so uh, this is a really good question, and this person also has the same last name as me, so I'm going to answer this one as my final question here today. Uh, do you allow patients to try hearing aids before buying them? If so, how many hearing aids can they try before purchasing? Uh, kind of a long answer here, but my standpoint on this is that uh, if you commit to doing hearing treatment, you're going to either commit all the way or you're not going to commit at all. Uh, what I don't believe in is sending individuals home with trial devices that are not custom programmed to that individual's hearing loss because it does not provide you with a realistic understanding of what your ultimate benefit will be. And if you can't have an understanding of what your ultimate benefit will be, uh, you'll never know whether or not you could be getting better benefit if you were fit appropriately. I think that people put way too much emphasis on the device that they pick versus how that device is programmed. I can take a device from pretty much any manufacturer and make it perform really well for an individual. Um, outside, and of course, there's always outliers in this to some degree, but what I'd, be, what I'd be spending my time on is finding a really, really good hearing care professional who follows all of the best practices of fitting hearing devices and say, hey, here's my situation. What device would be best for me? What are you most comfortable and if proficient with programming? And give me that device. And we need to let my brain adjust to that device. That's how I would be approaching it if I were you. Um, that being said, uh, a patient could technically, if we're you know a couple weeks into a 45-day fitting period, and they're like, yeah, I'm just not liking this device. It's just it's really not working well. It doesn't feel comfortable. I don't whatever. Um, I'll switch them to an alternative device if necessary inside of that window. But if you can't get it right the second time, um, the question becomes: Is is it even possible to get you what you want? So put less emphasis on the device put way more emphasis on the hearing care professional that you go see. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, that's fine, Dr. Irvin, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> um, I love this because it's talking about assistive listening devices. <clears throat> Do you suggest other assistive technology that individuals with hearing loss can use with or without a hearing aid as a holistic approach. I am a huge fan of remote listening devices and other accessories that you can use with your hearing aids. They have devices that you can clip on a loved one's shirt or a friend's shirt, and they can be talking to you from across the room, and that direct audio input into your hearing aids, you'll hear them better than what you will if they're just talking to you with hearing aids on alone. Um, background noise. If you struggle in background noise with hearing aids and those hearing aids have been programmed perfectly to your prescription and you still have struggles, a assistive listening device like a table microphone or one of those clip-on microphones can literally change your life. You can go from not being able to hear in those environments to being able to hear. On top of that, of course, you have direct connectivity with telephones. And if you can get audio streamed from your phone into both ears at your prescriptive level, again, something that will absolutely change your life. And then of course, television. And to be honest with you, all of the remote sessions I've been doing with my patients, they have two categories that they're falling into. Their calm situation program and their streaming program because they are watching more TV now than ever before. And when you can direct audio from a little TV connector from your TV to your hearing aids, you'll never hear TV any better. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Olson, for your time today. Um, your presentation was extremely informative and we have so many questions. We have 80 questions on the call. So I have a feeling we'll be contacting you to get some answers for our folks who have joined us today. Um, I need to thank Whitney for her captioning today. She did a marvelous job. Um, this presentation will be recorded and posted to the HRLA website at hearingloss.org. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you will all stay safe and well. And we will have um, new webinars very soon, and we might just ask Dr. Cliff to come back. So I think uh, that might be a good thing. So anyway, have a great day, everybody, and uh, take care. Bye-bye.